Welcome to this episode from the Global Performance Management Academy. My name is Dr. 3M and we will speak in this video about innovation management. How can we develop a strategic plan and performance management system for innovation? As you know now, companies, countries, they compete very severely, you know, using innovation in order to keep, be ahead of the game in such highly changing environment and very risky environment and competitive one in which we live today and in this video we'll show how can we take the topic of innovation in a formal and serious way and develop very clear strategy and KPI systems that helps us to keep track of our progress in achieving innovation in our organizations. This video is a little bit lengthy it's about one and a half hour so if you would like to skip some of the sections, you can jump straight to any section of your choice through the chapters index at the bottom. Let's quickly review the table of content of this presentation. First, we will try to answer the question, should we measure innovation in the first place or not? The second topic is five benefits of measuring innovation, why we need to measure innovation. Then five challenges of measuring innovation understanding the innovation process management before you develop a strategy or KPIs for anything, you need first to understand the nature of the process that govern the department or the activity that you would like to develop a strategy or KPIs for innovation strategy, innovation strategy map and balance scorecard. So we will give an example of both of them in this section. Innovation KPIs and what are the different types of innovation KPIs in order to strike a balance between the selected KPIs? How can we get the most out of the innovation KPIs? Global Innovation Index, which is a very popular index, index which is published uh, on an ongoing basis to rank countries in terms of their innovation activities and outcomes. And then time lags in innovation systems between whatever action you make and gaining a result or between the leading and lagging indicator, usually there are time lags and we will discuss these time lags using the concept of system dynamics in this section. And finally, we'll give a list of references which can be helpful for people interested to dig deep into this subject. If the common belief is that innovation is a very unstructured activity, which requires creativity and blue sky thinking. So why should we subject such activity into measurements and start to control the behavior of the team which is working in innovation? This is what we will discuss in this section. Thomas Edison, the most popular inventor in the history of mankind, once said that genius is 1% inspiration, but it's 99% perspiration. You need to sweat and work hard and do lots of trial and error and experimentation in order to transfer your creative ideas into a viable products that can add value to humanity. So in this 99% of the process that we need to subject to KPIs and control and measurement in order to make sure that it's done in an efficient and effective way. Uh, so a lot of people think about innovation as a mystical process of inspiration requiring natural genius or inborn talent. However, this downplays the role of deliberate creativity and structured effort. And this is what needs to be measured in generating new services, products, business models, and experiences. In reality, innovation is about structuring activity, creativity. So when you structure the creativity, you have a process, you have a flow, and you have timing, you have sequence of activities. You cannot just leave such activities without having KPIs and measurements. Otherwise, it, otherwise it will take forever and cost you lots of money before you can you know, uh, reap the fruits of your innovation activities. Peter Drucker, the father of management, he said uh, most innovations, especially the successful ones, result from a con conscious, purposeful search for innovation opportunities. 
So there is an organized activity which is conscious and purposeful and such activities needs to be treated as a production system of innovation that we need to measure its performance is an ongoing basis in order to find ways to streamline and improve its efficiency and effectiveness. So if innovation is a conscious and purposeful practice, this means it can and should be measured on an ongoing basis just like any other company metrics like we do in procurement in production in hr in finance we have metric system we should do the same thing with innovation because there are so many questions that need to be analyzed and tackled like where do the ideas come from does it come from internal or external resources the other question how many did we try out of these ideas how many moved to the next step of refinement and how much money did we spend and how much was the return on what we have spent the roi these are the different types of questions that we need to measure on an ongoing basis to make sure that innovation is done in an efficient and effective way mckinsey in a very you know recent uh, study they surveyed many companies they found out that 70 percent of corporate leaders rate innovation as their top three business priorities companies are paying more attention to innovation and they would like to compete using innovation as a competitive advantage however only 22 percent of those organization have set any innovation performance metrics so 70 percent are interested but they don't have a KPI system or a strategy in place to make sure that innovation is done in a proper way. In this section, we'll speak about the five benefits of measuring innovation. The first benefit of measuring innovation is encouraging innovation accountability. If people know that they will be measured and be held accountable for the time they spend in innovation, and the results expected from them, they will take the process seriously and it will not just be like a hobby or something nice to do. So if you regularly measure your company's innovative output and communicate these measurements, this will help encourage staff to think about innovation accountability on a daily basis and to take responsibility for finding new ways for doing things. They will take it very seriously, try to do things with less resources in a shorter time with higher impact and so on. Let's take one example. Hair is, you know, one of the most popular home appliances producer. They offer innovative peoples in their organization the ultimate recognition. What is the ultimate recognition? Having new products named after them. What a great recognition that they give to their employees. The second objective of measuring innovation is that it gives you objective numbers that reflect success and failure among different, you know, in innovation experimentations and efforts. So with the measurements, you can differentiate between good and the bad innovation activities, and you can have innovation tournament. Here in these pictures, you can see at Penn Medicine at University of Pennsylvania, the different innovation tournament that they have, uh, you know, conducted, and it shows in the article how this resulted large number of, uh, you know, teams competing and producing, you know, very exceptional results. The third objective for measuring the innovation is allocating resources effectively. We have limited budget, limited time of our staff, and we need to assign and allocate these resources to the most you know, productive and fruitful you know, innovation projects. So by tracking innovation KPIs, business has a lot more of information to help inform resource allocation. So innovation leaders can put dollars at the staff hours where they are needed the most and shape their innovation pipelines effectively. The fourth objective of measuring innovation is encouraging efficiency. Many think about efficiency as the enemy of innovation and suggest that true innovation happens when employees have unstructured time to think and create, which is not really true. 
because in fact, measuring innovations can encourage people to be more efficient with their creative efforts and to think more about the potential return on investment for each innovation. So when employees know no innovation is being tracked and measured, they tend to be a lot more serious and deliberate when it comes to creative exercises. So let's take an example of 3M, a very well-known company in innovation. So while 3M famously allocates 15% of its employees' time for blue sky thinking and the product innovation, it also requires employees to demonstrate the result of these efforts. So employees can enjoy 15% of their time in innovative activities, but they know that one in one point of time, they regularly they will be held accountable and ask it, what results have you achieved from allocating these resources? The fifth objectives of measuring innovation is that keeping investors happy. Somebody at the end of the day is paying the bill for all the time and the resources spent in innovation, so if investors and the sponsors can see in details of the direct benefits stemming from their investments in, invention, in, in innovation, they are more likely to back new ideas and be tolerant of the occasional innovation failure. So these KBIs are more objective, so they demonstrate that we are serious and it guarantee for us that investors know that we are taking these investments in, in an accountable way and they will be more, more willing to back us up in all our budget requirements for innovation. Maybe measuring finance and operation and the logistics can be easy, but you know, measuring innovation is a little bit challenging. And in this section, we will speak about five challenges of measuring innovation. The first challenge is that innovation is somewhat an unstructured process. So unlike the product development life cycle, innovation is not a standard process with defined milestones and checkpoints. So it's difficult to really to track all the aspects of motivation from this point of view. The second challenge is that innovation is not a one-man show. There are usually more than one person and one department, some of them internal and some of them external are involved in an innovation projects. And this will make it, of course, difficult to attribute certain credits, you know, and measure individual performance of different stakeholders. So innovative systems and solutions tend to have a much larger number of stakeholders. This will make it more challenging to measure and recognize individual contribution. The third challenge is that a measurement might result stifling the process of innovation. We always emphasize the need for creative freedom and the avoidance of too many rules and restrictions. So by placing so much prominence on results and statistics, we may risk stifling the process in the first place. So people will become more obsessed, you know, and pay more attention to the KPIs than the innovation process itself. And there is a very popular book, it's called The Tyranny of Metrics, and by Jerry Muller, you know, which speaks and gives so many cases and examples of how KPIs usually are stifling the creativity of people, and people will become paying more attention to the KPIs and making the numbers than you know, doing real results for their organizations. The fourth challenge is that uh, shooting ourselves in the foot. We might be developing KPIs, hoping that these KPIs will make people more creative, but it might backfire on us. So if you focus too much on metrics, you risk encouraging your employees to hit good numbers rather than being truly innovative. This is especially the case if you decide to make innovation KPIs part of employee performance review. In this case, you know, it affects their pay and salary and compensation, and they are, will be more keen to focus on short-term objectives rather than the long-term objectives. The last one, innovation might take lots of time, long time. Remember, innovation takes time, and not every creative concept can be measured as easily as the next 
So in fact, every innovation project can, can, can be considered as completely different in nature than the other one. So it will be very difficult to put a standardized process of measurements for all projects of innovation. So you wouldn't want to discourage a potentially world changing idea just because it didn't seem financially feasible in its early stages. So which is people will, uh, because KPIs usually look at short term effects, uh, results, and people will be more focused in, the, in making the numbers in the short term and uh, they might overlook a great opportunities that require long time to reap its fruit. Before we can start developing a strategic plan or KPIs for innovation, we really need to really understand the component of the innovation process and understand how these components interact with each other. Uh, there are many models around that we can use to study the uh, ecosystem and the different components of the innovation management process. One of them is the national innovation ecosystem, the country in which you operate and the company exists. So you need to look at the different companies, you know, how the, the government is spending its money and encouraging through its policies and how this affects large firm and small startup entrepreneurs, the R and the D research and development funding, the venture capital, which is available to support the new ideas and the research and technology organizations, which are a key players in the ecosystem. So this is an example of the different components of the ecosystem in any country. Another, um, you know, a model that we can use is the innovation process steps. Usually there are many steps and there are many models to describe these steps and the different their numbers. Step number one, usually the idea generation and mobilization. Step number two is advocacy, screening, and experimentation of these ideas. Step number three, turning the idea into a solution. And step number four, commercialization and the marketing of the products or the service that is produced from this innovation. And the step number five is diffusion and implementation in a wider scale. So we need to understand all of these different aspects of the innovation process before we can go ahead and develop strategic objective, uh, objectives and KPIs. The, also, there is the idea uh, management process. You know, different stakeholders play different roles. The employee, the category manager, the operative executive decision making group, and the project manager. You know, throughout the different phases of the innovation process, like the idea, uh, the idea first is created, collaborative development, decisions, implementations, and communication, and this results. So there are so many models, and Vima is one of the popular organization which publish lots of research and resources that people interested in the area of innovation, they can really find it very helpful. Another one is the innovation process for new services. This is another very interesting model, which, you know, have a process diagram, and in this diagram, you know, decisions are made, and whether you end the projects, like here, the projects ended here, ended here, ended here, ended here as well. So if you pass each gate, you go to the next step, and this describes different process that are used to develop a service. Also, there is a popular innovation pipelines. Usually you start with a large number of ideas. They are filtered and screened, and you get few of them that goes to the next phase, which is the concept phase. Few among them goes to the experiment phase, and then to the pilot phase, and then to the launch phase. We need, when we develop KPIs, to look at this flow or in the pipelines and to make sure there is enough flow quickly of good ideas that producing high impacts all the way to the end of the funnel. Another model is the new product development life cycle. And in this illustration, it shows six steps that starts with initiation, definition, readiness, technology readiness, design readiness, production readiness, and commercialization readiness. So these are the different phases. And there is, again, you know, decision has to be made 
for the product to move from one phase to the other. And you know, this line shows the investment that the company will be doing in each of these phases and how this investment accumulate and grow over the time. Usually, there is no standalone uh, innovation strategy that just stand by itself. You know, this is usually part of the overall strategy of the whole organization. So the direction of the whole organization is to be aggressive in the market and expand its market. Then, you know, innovation will become a choice and one of the enabler to achieve the overall strategy of the organization. At the corporate level, usually there are many strategic choices for the organization to choose from, and these strategies have been covered in details on the strategic analysis and strategy formulation course, which is offered by the Global Performance Management Academy. The choices here can, there are different families of strategies. There are the stability strategies, expansion strategies, retrenchment strategies, and combination strategies. You know, innovation is not necessarily required by all those types of strategies. It will not be required at all in some strategies. It will be required to a limited extent in other strategies, and it will be the core drivers in other strategies. Let's look at these examples. Under the stability strategies, there are the no change strategy, pause and proceed with caution strategy, profit strategies. Most likely, innovation will not be required if the company decided to go with one you know, these strategies. In the other hand, with the expansion strategies, there are the concentration strategy where you concentrate in certain market or products integration, whether it's vertical or horizontal integration, backward or forward integration. The diversification for sure, you know, you know, innovation will be a core component of a diversification strategy, as we will see later, cooperation strategy, internationalization strategy. Retrenchment strategy, there are three of them, turnaround, divestment, and liquidation. I don't see much of innovation required in both divestment and liquidation, but you might need to some extent, you know, innovation in the turnaround. The combination strategies is how you combine these strategies together. You can do e this either at a simultaneous way or sequential way or a combination of them. So uh, the innovation strategy is a component of the overarching strategy that the organization will choose for itself. The other important aspect uh, you know, that determines to what extent we need innovation or not is the red and the blue ocean strategies. And you know, in the red ocean strategy, which is a traditional, very competitive you know, environment, we secure competitive advantage in your current market so you stay in your market and you compete, and it's a you know throat slaughtering you know each one uh, you know in the uh, in the, the competitors start to reduce its price and so on. So uh, uh, according to the generic uh, strategies of Michael Porter, people compete either on differentiation, bringing special features their products to, the, to differentiate it from other products and then can charge a premium price for this or the other strategy is to have a low cost of course if you can combine both differentiation and low cost this will provide you a significant sustainable a competitive advantage this is all usually is done in the same market where you compete with other people but the blue ocean strategy is a new approach and way of thinking in which you make the competition irrelevant. You stay away from the competition altogether and to try to create your own new market and own new demand. We will see in the next slides, you know, the key differences between red and the blue ocean strategy, and it will become evident, you know, to what extent, you know, innovation is required under each one of them. Of course, the innovation will be required as a greater deal you know, if, we, when, if you adopt the blue ocean strategy. So let's look at the key differences between the red ocean strategy and the blue ocean strategy. First, in the red ocean strategy, you compete in existing market, but in the blue ocean strategy, you create uncontested market to serve. In the blue ocean strategy, you beat the competition. Here, you make the competition irrelevant. Here, you exploit existing demand 
but here you create and capture new demand, which of course require a great deal of creativity and innovation. Here you make the value cost trade off, but here you break the value cost trade off. You can do both. You try to increase the value and in the same time reduce the cost as well. And in the Red Ocean strategy, you align the whole system of the firm activities with its strategic choices of differentiation or low cost. But here you align the whole system of a firm's activities in pursuit of differentiation and low cost here or low cost, but here you try to do both of them. So one of the most popular tools that can help us identify where innovation and creativity is needed when you go for differentiation and expansion strategies is the ANSOF matrix. And this is again is explained details with lots of examples in the strategic planning course of GPMA. So the ANSOF matrix uh, classify our efforts to expand our revenue and increase our market share by focusing either on existing products or developing new products. And these products can be sold either in your existing market or you, you need to expand your marketing, uh, whether it is market segments within the same country or going beyond the can your country and start to export and go for international market. So in fact, if you look at these two divisions and the dichotomy, you, you will end up with four different strategic choices. The first one, of course, is the basic one is to continue to compete with your existing products in the existing market and to try to squeeze the market and kill the competition. And this is what's called the market penetration. You penetrate the market means that you try to reach to each segment of the market to squeeze all the juice in the current market and you don't let the competition you know, compete with you. The other choice is that to start to take your existing products and find a new market for it, which is called the market development. And this needs, you know, skills in marketing research, you know, exporting your products overseas and so on. The third choice is to develop a new product for your existing market. And this requires new product development. And of course, this falls in the course of innovation. The most challenging choice is the last choice, which is both to develop a new products and the market these products in a new market. So you have to really understand the new market and to try to come out with a new product for it. And in fact, the level of risk increase as you go from existing market to new market, your level of risk increase if you go this way. Also, when you leave, you try to develop new products and the level of risk will increase. So this is the least risky choice and this will be the highest risky choice. Uh, as you know from the ANSOF matrix, you need a great deal of innovation if you start to leave your comfort zone of you know, promoting uh, your current uh, products in your current market and start to develop a new products or to, uh, to develop a new market or, or do both of them. In this section, we'll start to speak about how to develop a strategy map and a balanced scorecard for innovation. In the beginning, we would like to just uh, give uh, some quick idea for those who are not familiar with the concept of balanced scorecard, which was introduced by Kaplan and Norton from Harvard Business School. Uh, it it, it provides an integrated framework for developing strategy and performance management system that is balanced and by balance here we mean that traditionally uh, organization used to focus on the financial aspect of their business and uh, as you know financial results is a historical results and it does not really give you an indication on the capability of the organization to continue to succeed and achieve good results in the future that's why in addition to focusing on the financial results the balance score card for you know money making organization focus on financial in addition they need to focus on customer because if you have good customers base who are very loyal and they will continue to buy your products this will guarantee for you 
revenue and the profit in the future. So you need to keep your customers happy and your market expanding and your market share growing in order to ensure financial results in the future. And of course, you will not be able to satisfy your customers unless you have a very sound and uh, you know fine-tuned internal process which produce good and services at a low cost and high quality to satisfy your customer. So the third aspect or perspective that the balance scorecard focus on is the internal process. These internal processes cannot be, you know, uh, performed uh, properly unless you have an internal capability, which is usually reflected in three types of capital. The human capital, which are your human resources, and then organizational capital, which is the environment in which you will be working and operating, and informational capital, which is the data and the information that they need to support them in their decision. So all of these three capitals or enablers fall in this capacity, you know, a perspective of the balance scorecard, which is usually called learning and growth, or it can be called the organizational capacity. So you have four perspectives. You have your team, your building, your data, your organization, which will enable you to do sound and streamlined operations, which will produce high value, low cost, you know, products, which keeps your customer happy. And if your customer happy and buying these products, you know, for premium, you will be able to achieve financial results. Focusing on all of these four aspects, what is what it make it balanced? And these four perspectives are very generic and they exist almost in any organization, whether it is profit-making or not profit-making organization. Of course, the only difference that we will need to make is to move the financial perspective for charitable and non-profit organization or even government organization, move it and put it at the bottom of these four perspectives. So the story will go like this, that we need to secure financial resources to pay for our staff and uh, organizational capability and information system, which will enable us to deliver, you know, good products and services, which will make our customer happy. And this will be the top perspective because for non-profit uh, organization, their objective is to serve their stakeholders or customers. Now, these four perspectives, in fact, they have, a, a, you know, vertical, uh, themes that cut across all of them and these themes are you know can be considered as the key pillar of your strategy or the key uh, directions of your strategy and usually the themes while the perspectives are horizontal the themes are vertical usually strategy is one of those themes so you have an overall balance scorecard for your organization or a strategy map and in, if the corporate strategy requires innovation, then innovation will become a theme. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that you might not have, you know, a, a whole strategy just dedicated for innovation, but it will be a subset of the overall strategy. And this subset in the language of the balance scorecard is what we call theme. And the theme cut across the four perspective, you know, vertically. So let us, you know, get familiar with some of the terminology of the balance scorecard and it provides, in fact, the balance scorecard provides us, you know, a, a bird's eye view, very high level view, and then it takes us down all the way to the lower operational level. Let's look at this pyramid. In fact, at the top, you have your customer, you know, stakeholders and market needs, and of course, shareholders' expectation. So you develop emission statements that serve these customers, and then you have your vision statements. Then you will have the four strategic perspectives, which are the horizontal one, which we illustrated in the previous slides. And then you will have your strategic themes that are the vertical one. And this, as we mentioned earlier, they are the main focus area, pillars of excellence uh, that are driving key results. Then you will have the inside those four perspectives. You will have your strategic objectives, and this is what we will call, you know, a strategy map. For each strategic objective, you need KPIs because the key performance indicators are the objective numeric tools 
that will help you to judge to what extent you are advancing and progressing and achieving your strategic objectives. Each KPI has a formula to, you know, for its calculation, the source of the data which will be used in the formula, and it will have this, the, the baseline, which is the value of the KPI today, and the target, which is the value of the KPI, which you would like to achieve at the end of the period. Of course, the gap between the current value of the KPI and the target value of the KPI is the performance gap. In order to bridge this performance gap, you need to do something to improve the performance. And this something is what we call strategic initiatives or programs or projects. So they are the projects and the action plans that drive results. You can have different initiatives that help you drive, you know, one or more KPIs in order to achieve your objectives, which ultimately will help you to achieve your vision and mission and satisfy your stakeholders and shareholders, of course. Let us take here a generic innovative innovation strategic team. Imagine that you have a big strategy map and we just are taking slice, or which is one of the themes in the strategy map, which is relevant to innovation. This theme, as we you know, indicated earlier, will cut across the four perspectives, which is the learning and growth, the internal process, the customer perspective, and the financial perspective for money-making or profit-making organization. So let's look inside this perspective, what kind of strategic objectives we will have inside each of those perspectives. First, at the learning, uh, the learning and the growth, which is the capacity, organizational capacity, you need to improve innovation culture. You need to instill a culture which encourages people to come up with new ideas, innovative ideas, and just get out of the box, you know, in order to achieve the organization objective. The other thing that you need to build good partnership programs with external, you know, stakeholders and use sometimes crowdsourcing in order to come up with the new ideas and even do the implementation and the, the, the intellectual property, you know, for, uh, for the, all the innovation advancement that you need to make. So at this level, you need to work on culture and you work in partnership. We can add another objective here, which is related to, you know, training, you know, competency development of our team in the area of, uh, you know, innovation, also having the innovation management system that help us track all the innovation projects. You can add them here as well, uh, but if, if for sake of simplification, we just limited ourselves to two strategic objectives. The second perspective is the internal process perspective. So what we will have here, we have improved market assessment. You need to have very good market intelligence to, you know, to collect information about market, you know, expectation and future demands and the trends. And in the same time, you need to uh, involve your customers in generating ideas and providing you with innov innovative ideas. The other thing is to improve concept development. You need a very streamlined internal process, which will help you to, you know, to, to go through the funnel, the process, of innovation management. If you do this both, uh, you know, good, then you'll be able to achieve a higher level objective, which is improve product life cycle management from idea to development, to launching to the market and starting to realize the revenue and the profit of this. This should take the very short time. Then at the customer level, if you do all of these things well, you will be able to strengthen customer interaction and improve the value of offer to your customer for the money they are paying for the products. Now, what you will result from out all of this at the financial level is increasing revenue because of increasing sales, especially if you come up with the new innovation and you, will, you are the first one in the market to do this, like they do in the pharmaceutical sector, you will be able to generate lots of revenue. And the other thing that you need to work at is management development uh, expenses to, to manage development expenses. So in order to achieve the return on investment, if you increase your revenue and decrease your cost, 
you will be able to increase your profitability. So what you see here is a small section of a big strategy map that focus only on the slice that are, is related to innovation, which is called the, we call it the innovation theme. Of course, the, what we have presented here is very generic and you need to tailor this based on the circumstances of your organization. Now we will take the strategy map that we have developed for the innovation theme and try to develop a full village balance scorecard. To do this, we need to have column for the objectives, the KPIs, and the initiatives. In the objectives, we just copy these three objectives and write them here, and then we develop KPIs for each of these objectives. For example, increase profitability, we can have operating income, total sales, return on product development expenses, this is ROI, the, the revenue is the, uh, the fraction, you will have the revenue divided by how much you have invested. Of course, you invest lots of money, but you get a stream of uh, revenue, so you need to have a discounted you know, uh, you know, uh, value of the stream of money, which will be generated over the next few years in the life cycle of the products. So what initiatives you will need at this level? Maybe implement cost reduction program is a good initiative here because the recall the other KPIs like increasing revenue, usually there is no initiatives for them because they are lagging indicators and the work you need to do in order to achieve some results here is usually done at the lower levels. So usually there are very few initiatives that you can make for lagging indicators because most of the initiatives will be done for the leading indicators. Now let's go to the customer perspective. We just copy the two objectives and put them here, improve customer value and strengthen customer interaction. For improve customer value, you can have the customer value index, which you measure you know, customer satisfaction and the value for money for the products they are buying. And the customer product development ratio can be used as an KPI here. So what you need to do here as an initiative, target and enlist customers as product co-creator, which is a very good you know, way of engaging your customers. Let's go to the internal process perspective, improve product life cycle management, improve concept development, and improve market assessment. The KPIs here can be stage gate exit ratio. You remember we talked about the pipeline, and how the ideas move across this pipeline, and there is a gates, you know, move, you know, gates that you need to cross. So the stage gate exit ratio, the number of ideas captured, and the product forecast accuracy. You did marketing forecast here, which is was the basis for your business plan to justify the investment in the idea. Now you need to go back and check whether your forecast and was accurate was accurate or not. Uh, so what initiatives we can put here, we can build and roll out a stage gate process. So you structure a process for the stage and the gates for the, the, you know, the innovation uh, pipeline process, create market intelligence knowledge base in order to improve your data collections and analysis of your market condition. At the learning and growth level, improve innovation culture, and enhance partnership. The KPI here can be employee culture score. So you can have, there's many assessments that you can use in order to measure to what extent your staff, you know, feel that they have the freedom for to be innovative and they get the support of their management and they get their time and resources needed to do this. And the number of intellectual property partnerships that you have signed or achieved with uh, other partners. And the initiatives here can be a smart co-initiatives. So you launch inside your organization, a smart co-initiative for cultural change and university outreach to build, you know, industry academy, academia relationship with local universities who you can work with in order to uh, execute your innovation projects. If you look at this, this is a strategy map with the scorecard. Of course, in a full-fledged scorecard for each KPI, you will have the 
baseline, which is the value of the KPI today, and the target. And this target can be one year, two years, five years, and even you can break it down to a smaller time periods. So you have for each year, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and so on. Uh, this is the how the balance scorecard looks like for the uh, innovation strategic team. In this section, we will speak about uh, different types of KPIs that are used to measure innovation, and it's important to also uh, classify KPIs into different types. Why classification to different types is important? Because you need to strike a balance between the different types of KPIs. If you don't have types of KPIs, you cannot do any balancing. So classification of KPIs will help us to do this. And we will take so many examples of KPIs. Uh, so the first popular classification of KPIs is to classify them into input, process, output. Let us focus here on the input and the output KPIs. The input KPIs, they measure the quantity of innovation enablers, the input, the investment that the organization does. Then the organization is investing. For example, the total value of company investment in innovation. So this is measured in, in, you know, in dollars. The second thing, the number of uh, hours, the employees' time allocated to innovation exercise. And this is, is calculated in terms of number of hours. And here it's aggregated for all type of employees. It did not differentiate between top management and, many, and middle management. Uh, uh, output KPIs, they measure whether your innovation investments are having the desired effect. Have you produced the desired results or not? Uh, one example is the number of new products released to market in the past two or three years. The other one, the revenue generated from these products. So this is number of products, but you know, number of products is not enough usually because you can have so many products, but they are not generating significant income. And that's why you need to take another uh, dollar value KPIs in order to balance. Uh, and the other thing, you don't need all your income to come just from one product because this is too much risky. So you need variety of products and you need in the same time high volume of revenue. So these are examples of input KPIs and output KPIs. Uh, there is also different domains or aspects that we can measure innovation in. The first one, you can have KPIs related to capabilities, which in nature is an input. So what are the capabilities? They are the abilities, practical skills, unique insights and know-how of the people, tacit knowledge and other information capital, as well as financial capital needed to create innovation. So this is about how much you are uh, investing in your organization. The second one is the structure, the inside process and the structure that you set, which will make use of these capabilities. It's the organizational structure, the processes, the resources and the other tools that support innovation management, such as innovation management software. There is a very, you know, you need software when you have a huge number of projects running at the same time in the pipeline in order to control all of these, you, know, you need the software to do this. So this is structure. The third domain is culture, which is the soft aspect of the organization. The capabilities related to people that support the process, innovativeness of an organization, and the need for always getting better. So this desire in the people and the freedom, you know, and the encouragement of their leadership, to, to be creative, it's a very essential element of uh, innovation ecosystem. The fourth one is a leadership and strategy, strategic aspects that are linked to concrete operations. So usually you need the strategy part of it and the execution part of it. Finally, business and the product metrics, which is the final outcome. So in fact, you can consider all of these four are different types of input, and this is the output. It is the ROI, the return on investment KPIs. It focuses on measuring the results the innovation investments has yielded. So these are different categories of KPIs, and we will take a few examples you know, under each of these categories. Let us take a few examples of financial KPIs. First, percentage of revenue generated 
from recent innovations, for example, products released to market in the last two to three years. So this is percentage of this revenue to the overall revenue of the organization. Of course, you need to maintain high percentage of you know revenue coming from new products to make sure that you know you are uh, uh, always updating your product portfolio. Percentage of revenue coming from international versus domestic markets. Reality licensing and come from patents. New products contributions to sales margin. Profit and the loss impact of new products or services introduced in the past X number of years. R and this bending to products conversion. Percent of R&D budget against recent, recent product revenue. Percentage of capital invested in innovation activities. Let us take, uh, so let us take one of these uh, KPIs, uh, financial KPIs. Percentage of company sales stemming from recent products. In, in the 3M company, which is a very popular company known for its innovation, they the really set a target for such a percentage. 3M stipulates that a minimum of 30% of each division's revenue. So this target is set for each revision, not for the overall for the organization. Must come from products introduced in the last four years. We have to be cautious here because there are risks for using or focusing so much on financial KPIs when it comes to innovation. Yeah, as you know, financial KPIs encourage safe investment many of the greatest product innovations have taken time to break even so financial kpis might you know push the people involved in innovation to be short-sighted even though that innovation is a long-term initiative companies need to back risky ideas in order to succeed even when these ideas could be costly in the short term there is a very nice article which is titled how an obsession with metrics is killing your company and enco or you know Inc publication is a very popular publication they have a very interesting article titled five successful companies that didn't make a dollar for five years and they stated examples are like fedex and amazon and the tesla so they have not made money during five years if the if their top management has, you know, given up and put some financial KPIs in the first for, you know, to monitor their progress in the first two to three years, they could have given up and not, you know, uh, achieved the results that they have achieved. So we have to be very cautious that financial KPIs might push us to be short sighted and focus on the short term, not in the long term, which is in nature of innovation projects. Innovation funnel KPIs. It's uh, you know one of the KPI, one of type of the KPIs is to monitor the flow of the uh, innovation projects throughout the funnel. For example, the number of innovative projects progressing through projects milestones each quarter. So you need to monitor how many of the products has passed from the inside to the idea stage to the discussion to the experiments, to the prototype, to the products, and then to the commercial success or failure. And usually you need to take the ratio of each step, you know, divided by the step before that. So you, you find a ratio of one, uh, the next step on the previous step, to, to tell you what the ratios, like percent of ideas uh, turn it into experiments. So you need to keep monitoring this percentage that reflect the flow of the uh, innovation projects throughout the funnel, the funnel. A very popular type of KPIs in innovation is the timesheet KPIs, which keeps the track of how much time the team is investing in innovation activities. So in order to do this, you need to designate codes for time spent innovating. For example, you can call it blue sky thinking code or product brainstorming code. So if the, you have this system of uh, having every member of your organization is, uh, you know, coding you know, or recording how much time they spend in different activities in a timesheet, putting these codes will help you at the end of the day 
to aggregate all the time that was spent. Different KPIs can be used in this case. The first one is percentage of overall staff time spent on high yield innovation activities. The other one is very similar, but this is a percentage. This is an absolute number of hours, amount of hours of overall staff time spent on high yield innovation activities and the amount of leadership time spent sponsoring and overseeing innovation activities. So this is for staff in total, whether it's a percentage or an absolute number of aggregate hours. And this is only focusing on the leadership and the role they play in overseeing and sponsoring innovation projects. Uh, another types of KPIs is the new products and service KPIs. Let us look at a few examples. Percentage of revenue from new products or services introduced in the past six years. Revenue from products or services sold to new customer segments. So here it's focusing on customer, you know, market expansion and introducing new customer segments. Percentage of existing customers trading up to next generation products. So when you, you come up, like when Tesla came up with the electric car, not everybody was encouraged, you know, to do this. So how many of those early adapters in the market were willing to buy and risk buying the new products from you? Because it's a good indication. The other one is number of ideas turned into innovation experiments by employees. So these are the different types of KPIs for products and services. Another type is training and staff competency KPIs. This is very critical, of course, and usually it falls in the learning and growth perspective of the balance scorecard. Number of idea turned into patents by employees. Cost of educational allowances paid out to employees for innovative areas of study. Percentage of employees using innovation software. Number of teams that submit projects for innovation award or tournaments. Staff satisfaction index of their involvement in innovation experience. So you can run like a survey for people participating in these projects, asking them how they feel about the experience. Percentage of employees trained in the innovation process. So if you have an in-house process and the manual for this, you need to train them. And number of employees identified as entrepreneurs. So, and classifying certain people within the organization into entrepreneurs and giving them this, you know, honorable title required, you know, that they fulfill certain qualification uh, or requirements. And this uh, uh, article by Forbes, it speaks about the four essential traits of entrepreneurs within any organization. Another types of innovation KPIs is the management and leadership KPIs. Let us look at a few examples. Number of managers with formal innovations training and access to innovation tools. Staff assessment of role of the executive in fostering innovations and driving employees to be creative when responding to customer needs. The number of innovative projects being sponsored or overseen by senior managers. The amount of time senior leaders spend on innovative projects, and we have mentioned this earlier with the timesheet KPIs. The number of major, major market innovations driven by senior leaders. Number of innovative projects progressing through project milestones each quarter driven by leaders. And finally, number of active innovation projects per division or business unit. Let's look here at cross classification of KPIs. We can classify KPIs based on the domain that we are measuring and in the same time, whether they are input or output. Why we should care about this? You know, we should care about this because we need to have a balance between or among the KPIs that we will be selecting. And it's very important to focus in both input, which is short term, and output, which is lagging long term. Because if you only say that output is what matters so let's only focus on the actual results which is output and there is no need to monitor the input this can be very risky because if you only monitor output and you discover after two or three years that you have not achieved the results that you are expecting 
it will be too late to go and fix any problems you have in the input. So you need, uh, you know, to monitor input to give you early signals and where things are not working in order to fix them. Let's look at a few examples. Uh, the capability as an input, uh, a, a KBI can be the number of new challenges provided for employees. Structure input, the, the relative or absolute budget allocated to innovation or R&D. Culture, the number of new ideas coming from employees versus coming from management. Leadership and strategy, the number of executives receiving training related to innovation. And finally, business and product, the percentage of capital invested in innovation activities. For output under capabilities, the percentage of capital invested in innovation activities. Structure, the velocity of the build, measure, learn, feedback loop, which is a part of the learning organization. Culture, the employee participation in innovation activities. And leadership and strategy, the percentage of management's time spent on strategic innovation. And finally, business and the products actual versus targeted break even time. Uh, here we will is a just a laundry list or a big list of uh, innovation KPIs classified based on three categories input, process, and performance outcomes. This is a list of input KPIs. This is another list of process or activities KPIs, and these are performance outcomes. There is lots of repetition among these KPIs and the one we mentioned earlier, but I just put them here as a reference for those who are interested to look at this type of classification. It's very important not to overload ourselves with so many KPIs because you know having so many KPIs which are difficult to use might really complicate the matters and waste lots of resources which might not yani, is not warranted. So it's interesting to classify KPIs based on the difficulty of measurements and the relevance of the metrics or the KPI itself. And this graph here shows different distribution of the KPIs according to this classification. Of course, you should start with KPIs which are easy to measure, but provide you high impact. So this will be your first candidate of KPIs. Then you will go for these KPIs. Then, of course, you will go for this, which is high difficulty. And finally, this will be your last choice. KPIs which are difficult to measure, but they are not adding a real value to you. Here I will share with you some tips on how can we get the most out of the innovation KPIs. Uh, first, focus on few metrics at a time and prioritize them, as I showed you earlier in this dichotomy classification of importance and ease of use. Second, find opportunities for learning and improvement. So you can start to set KPIs and discover later that they are not the best choices, so you still have the opportunity to update them and fine tune them. Assess the life cycle of the innovation. Don't force the same metrics for everyone, because as I mentioned earlier, innovation projects can vary very much from one to the other. Reduce complexity, start simple, keep it simple, and engage employees, those that you the people that you will measure their performance, they should be included in the discussion of which KPI is more suitable to monitor the, their performance in the area of innovation. Sometimes it's, it's, it's important to measure the level of maturity of your organization. Of course, as if you adopt innovation after a few years, there will be lots of lessons learned your uh, maturity, the policies, the culture, the, the how you master, uh, you know, the, the process management, using the software, learning from other experiences, building good partnerships with other, you know, organizations that can support you in the innovation journey. All of these things, they don't just happen, you know, all of a sudden, but they require time. And the more you invest in the innovation process, the more, you will become more proficient in doing this. So there are different tools that can be used to measure innovation maturity. 
here we will mention one of them uh, and the, in this one there is a the link it's accept mission uh, you can uh, check this out uh, start innovation maturity quick scan how big is the innovation power what is already working well and what can you optimize or add with this innovation maturity quick scan we measure the innovative strength of the organizations in five different domains and so on so this is the one of the uh, innovation maturity uh, assessment tools and usually there are different levels this applies to all uh, assessment of maturities of different types uh, at the end of the assessment your organization can be classified as in the stage of initiated or defined or managed or optimized and the this example that i brought to you here uh, focus on five domains for innovation uh, maturity assessment the first one is goals and performance second one is people and culture and then the innovation process the tools and the it used to support the innovation management process and finally management and organization and when scaled up to 100 and these are the four level of maturity in each of the five domains and of course the report will give you the overall assessment and the gaps and the roadmap for development in the previous sections we focused more on innovation at a corporate or enterprise level here we will speak about innovation at country level international level and we will focus more on the global innovation index reports which is published every year this report is published by the WIPO, which is a World Intellectual Property Organization. And these are the different components that are taken into consideration to build up the overall score for each country involved in this assessment. As you look at this hierarchy, the Global Innovation Index is an average of different indexes. And also, I will describe later the innovation efficiency ratio. So the global innovation index is the average of all of these factors. The first half of them is input factors, and these are output factors. But the innovation efficiency ratio is the ratio of the overall input you know, components to the uh, output components. Let's look at the input components. Remember that we are talking here at a country level not at a company or an organization level. First, the institutions within the country, and the, this includes the political environment, regulatory environment, and the business environment. Then the human capital and research, education, treachery education, research and development. Infrastructure, ICTs, which is the information and communication technology sector, general infrastructure in the country ecological sustainability and then market sophistication the credit market availability of loans investment trade and competition finally business sophistication which include knowledge workers innovation linkage and the knowledge absorption these are all considered to be input or enablers that the government of any country can invest in and uh, issue public policies to support all of this one, two, three, four, five by three, 15 factors. The output of the innovation are two categories. Each one of them had three, so they are six in total. The first one is knowledge and technology outputs. So this is the knowledge creation, the knowledge impact, and the knowledge diffusion. And the creative output include intangible assets, creative goods and services and online creativity of course we will not be able here to go through each of those elements and describe what they mean and what they entail but people who are interested in this they can look it up in the internet and i have included lots of links here so you can go back again and look in this at this report in detail this is the 2022 report the global innovation report and this is a link where you can go and download the report and you know there is lots of uh, results the results of the classification 
and the index is made in different ways. I just quoted for you here an interesting one, which should give you the top three innovations economies by region. So first, the Southeast Asia, number one was Korea, number two was Singapore, and number three was China. The Central uh, Southern Asia, number one was India, number two was Iran, and number three was Uzbekistan. And then Northern Africa and the Western Asia, Israel, United Arab Emirates, and Turkey. And then Europe, number one was Switzerland. In fact, Switzerland was, was not the number one globally. Sweden and the United Kingdom. Sub-Sahara Africa, number one was South Africa, Botswana and Kenya. Northern America, of course, United States and Canada. And Latin America and the Caribbean, Chile, Brazil, and Mexico. So these are the top countries, you know, by region in the globe. This, uh, you know, part of the detailed report, and it shows the top 19 and the score that each one of those countries have achieved. And as you see, Switzerland come at the top, within United States, Sweden, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Korea, Singapore, Germany, Finland, Denmark, China, and so on. But at the bottom of the list, the list goes all the way to 132. You can see, you know, this is the bottom of the list. It has Nigeria, Algeria, it has Togo, it has Mali, Yemen, Iraq, and so on. Uh, this is a very interesting part of the report, which shows how the investment uh, is changing by major uh, player in the innovation sectors in different sectors. So in the ICT hardware and the electrical equipment sector, this graph shows percentage change between 2022 and 2021. So NVIDIA, their investment or the amount of money they invested has increased by almost maybe 40% over the past year. And all of this company increased their investment. And they include, of course, Apple and Intel and Ericsson, Siemens and Nokia and so on. But two companies at the bottom, they have decreased the amount they have. And you can see here, significant decrease by 50% by Dell Technologies. So this is how the major players in the ICT sectors have increased or decreased their investment in uh, innovation. Let us compare this with another sector, which is the pharmaceutical and the biotechnology. You know, in fact, you can see in, in, in total, you know, there is more increase than in the ICT. Of course, with the coronavirus and the race to, uh, you know, to produce all these vaccines, AstraZeneca, of course, and Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly, all of these were at the top investors in the pharmaceutical sector and at the bottom there are three companies which have reduced their their annual budget that they are you know they allocate for expenditure in r d this shows us this graph how countries has been switching places so uh, i think uh, uh, number one was all switzerland so look here between 20, 2018 19, 20, 21, and 22, Switzerland has maintained the first position throughout, you know, these five years. And in position number two, the United States of America was uh, here, was number, in, uh, was classified as number six, maybe, and then it dropped to number three, and then to number two. Now, now it's, it's not dropped, it's, you know, went up, uh, and so on for each of those countries. And as you see, some countries, are swinging to a great extent, uh, like Republic of Korea. Republic of Korea, they are, have improved a lot during the last few years. And you can see who's going up and who's going down in this graph. Innovation input to output performance. This is very interesting, uh, you know, uh, correlation is that uh, you can invest lots of money in building institutions, R&D, centers, you know, education, software, and so on. But you, you might not be doing this in an efficient 
or a smart way so you might not be able to you know get the uh, results like other uh, countries does and uh, that's why it's very important to relate the input to the output in order to see how efficient the countries are in utilizing their input to convert it into an output so some economists are very efficient at converting innovations input to outputs and to do this the if you recall in the graph there was two sections there was the you know 15 factors in the input and the six factors in the output so if you aggregate all the input and the output and you put it in this score you put it in this scale so all the input are here and all the outputs are here so you go for any country like Brunei Darussalam for example Brunei Darussalam they achieved this score in the amount of resources they have deployed to innovation but they only were able to achieve output at this level so they were not that efficient in fact the break even is this line here if you fall in this line mean that you're spending 50 percent and you are gaining 50 percent in fact 50 percent yes this is the line here so this is the break even where uh, input when divided by output is equal to one or the so uh, all the countries that fall beneath this line they are inefficient because they are using so much input but they are not making a higher output the opposite is this side countries which they invest little inputs but they were able with this little inputs to achieve higher returns so and in order to find the this look at the high slope at the point of the high slope maybe pakistan and sri lanka here because if you draw a line to pakistan or sri lanka the line will come this way so pakistan they only have like 28 percent investment but they are getting uh, 20 in, uh, in in output so this is pakistan here uh, if you look at other countries united States, uh, arab emirates saudi arabia qatar they are putting lots of money but they are not getting the, the the results expected but there is a catch here and there is something that we have you know to to be careful of when they are comparing the input to the output they are comparing 2022 input to 2022 output and this in fact is not fair and we will explain this in a later you know in the next uh, section that usually the input that you invest does have a very long lag period so the results of this investment you will not be able to see it until many years later so it's not fair to judge uh, you know to make a quick judgment and say that we are investing so much but we are not seeing the results like other countries because other countries they are ahead of you in the learning curve so for example if you invest today in basic education you will not see the results of the, your investment in basic education before another 10, 15, maybe 20 years. Because by the time these students, which are at the KG age or elementary school age, you are investing so much time for their, you know, to improve their innovation skills, they will not be able to contribute until they graduate from university, have a job, and then, you know, they will start seeing their results. So there is a big time lag between input and output in fact if you need to have a fair comparison between this input and output you should put here five years ago input and compare it to today output so countries like united arab emirates and saudi arabia and qatar they might have started investing today in heavily in innovation infrastructure but you know these investments are not expected to bring any results in the short term, but we should expect that in the long term. So this is my critique or comment regarding this graph. In the last section, we highlighted the importance of taking time lags in consideration between the input investment and the output results which you will gain from your innovation system. And because there are so many inputs that each one of them have different effect and the different you know, velocity and the different time lags to show its results. Usually it's so much complicated to really expect and uh, what will be the expected outcome for the, from the investment 
that you are making and uh, uh, not having this uh, relationship understood clearly in your mind might result that you rush into making a judgment about some investment that they are not worthwhile or, uh, or it's, they are not producing the expected results and you may rush to uh, you know, stop your investment. So how can we understand the, uh, you know, this relations among the input and the output factors? System dynamics provide us with a very uh, interesting tool to understand such dynamics of uh, relationship. And uh, this subject has been explained in detail in one of our courses for the key performance indicators and how system dynamics can help us understand the relations between the leading and the lagging indicators and identifying the performance drivers. Here we'll just have a quick overview in this section of how system dynamics can be utilized to understand these relations. If you recall, the, in the world index for innovation, there was input and output. I listed all the inputs here. If you recall, they were uh, under four categories. And these four categories, institution, information, human capital, and the market sophistication. So there are 12 of them. And uh, there is the outcome, which is the knowledge and technology, and the creative output. The question is that, what is the relation among these variables? Does each one of those affect equally to produce these results? Do we need all of these in the same time? What are the interrelationship among these? Is investment in one can help you in the other. So if you investment in education, it help you, of course, in the research and the development and so on. Your political regulations will affect credit. For, for example, and so on. So what is the relation among those? Which one of them has more weight or impact than the others? And how long it takes for investment in each of those categories? Uh, you know, how long it takes to show results here? So if you have fiber optics network in the ICT section, for example, you know, once you have this fiber optics network extending, you know, throughout the country and high-speed internet, you know, by when I should see a result in this? And what's the relation between this and the other ones? So usually this is not clear. We list KPIs as an input and output, and we monitor all of them. And even when we put, make a dashboard and have all of the KPIs with the lagging indicator, the outcome at the top and the leading at the bottom, like we have in the balance scorecard, when you see that you are investing in the enablers, and all the KPIs are green, but the KPIs at the top, they are still red because it takes so much time for this to work out to affect the lower one. Without really understanding this time lag, you will not be able to interpret or make sense of the dashboard that shows all of these results because you don't know how much time it takes. Uh, and uh, between each one of those, the arrows, the cause and effect relationship, even the thickness of the cause and relation relationship or you know how much impact is putting one million here is more worthwhile than putting one million here or one million here or what you know we you know all of this needs to be found out and the modeled and the system dynamics will help us and do this so this is at the national level the same thing at the core enterprise level or the corporate level we listed so many KPIs as input KPIs, like the RD spending, the human resources time devoted, you know, the pipeline ideas and so on, the ratio of ideas from inside and outside. Suppose I worked very hard in, you know, moving the needle up in all of these KPIs. What should I expect, you know, from the other side in the other side? So what should I expect there? So this is, uh, uh, we don't understand this relationship business uh, simulation or the system dynamic modeling will help us to do this. So let us just take a quick overview of the key, key principles of system dynamics and how it can, it can be used to model the relationship of innovation system, which will enable us to better manage these systems. Yeah, of course, the concept of system dynamics was introduced First, by a very notable scholar, his name is Jay Forrester at MIT, Massachusetts Institute 
of technology. He passed away in 2016. I was very, you know, you know, fond of him, and uh, I was trying to translate his books. Back in 1976, I started translating one of his books called Industrial Dynamics. The core concepts of the system dynamics is uh, basic components that any phenomena has an inflow, stock, and outflow. So the level of uh, R&D in your country, they reach to a certain level. This level goes up, the more you invest, the more R&D you make. And the less you invest, or if you get migration of your talents, people who are very talented in your country start to apply for immigration in other countries, so you are losing them. So how many scholars you have in your country, this will depend on how many you have now, and how many new ones you will have, and how many you will lose, and so on. Adoption of new softwares, how many people in the, in the market are buying the new technologies that you are invested. There are certain number of people, they get more, you, you, this number goes up, the more people are adopting the technology, but when people abandon this technology or give up, you know, they, they are taken away, they subtract from your stock. So the three key components is the inflow and the stock and the outflow. And they represent this in system dynamics in diagram, which is similar to this one. So this is the stock and this is the inflow and this is the outflow. And these nodes here are the rate at which the inflow is coming. How, you know, far you are opening the water tap, which is, you know, pouring water into your sink. And this is the drainage, the water, you know, taken out from your sink. How big is the drainage opening that is taking this? And these are called the connectors. So these are the external variable that affect this rate. You know, the more you can increase or decrease this depends on what's called the connector. So in order to learn how to use system dynamics to model anything, basically you need these four, you know, components. Uh, of course, you know, there is also something called positive loop and the negative loops in system dynamics. Let me give you an example of negative loops. Negative loops mean the more the input comes and the stocks goes up, the more, the less, the next inflow, this will affect the upcoming inflow. Let me say this again. In the negative feedback loop, more of the stock will result in less in the inflow which is coming. So when you eat and you are full, it means you will eat less. In the beginning, you are very hungry. Your stomach is not empty. So you are eating a lot. So when you fill your stomach, by the time, you, your, time your stomach is getting filled, you start to lose appetite and you cannot eat anymore. Uh, so this, it, it reduces. The more you have in your stomach, the less you'll be eating. The same thing applied to the toilet flush and the floater here, the floating ball, this floating ball moves up, when the water comes in, it moves this up, and when this moves up, it closes the valve of the incoming water, so less water will become. Maybe you notice this, when the motor, when the water starts to, do, after you flush the toilet, and the tank is empty, you hear the flow, the water coming in a high velocity but gradually it decreases, decreases. So the more water is in, the more is coming in. So these are different phenomena in nature that you need here. This is called the negative feedback. The, the positive feedback is more results more and more results more. Like for example, bacteria multiply. If you have one bacteria, it multiplies to two. And the two, each one multiplies to two, then you have four and the four, you will have eight and the eight, you will have 16. So you have exponential growth. So the more you get, the more you will, it will be there in the next phase. And usually you model, you can model such thing, you know, the water flow and the level of the water of the tank. You can build a system dynamic models that represent this. This basic concepts apply to any phenomena on life, almost any phenomena on life. Is the, the Jay Forrester developed the model for industries, behavioral model of the industries, simulation model, and he published this in a very popular book called the Industrial Dynamics, and he used the language called the Dynamo, 
back early. Now there is more easier friendly language, programming language. It's called Stella, which is easier to use. Uh, then he built a model of an urban area and called it urban dynamics. And then he I have another book about world dynamics, where you have the relations between the countries, political and commercial uh, relations among the countries. Uh, innovation, adoption, uh, system dynamics modeling, you start to talk about the number of potential adopters and the adoption rates and the adopters of the new technology. Of course, when you have more adopters, they affect the adopters rate because by word of mouth, they will start to speak to other people about it. But you know, over time, there will be market saturation. You reach where everybody already knows about it. So the grow will not continue in the same rate. This is another example of how the use system dynamic, where you have three technologies in system dynamic. You have technology M, technology B, and technology E. And this is a total supply, which are fed by these three technologies. And each technology has a rate of growth and of all of these technologies. So this is a different quick model of how system dynamics is used in innovation. Another model here is at the producer side, system dynamics. So, you know, if you have diffusion of the new technology, new invention, you will sell more. So the, your total production volume will go up. You will go up in the learning cave, curve and you will have economies of scale. This, of course, look at the negative here. You know, this were all, all positive. More diffusion, more sale, more sale, more production more production, more learning, but more learning, less per unit cost. And this will help you with your price. And then you can, your technology will be attractive. People will be able to buy the technology. Also, when you sell more and you produce more, your revenue will go up and your income will go up. And this will help you to reinvest again in R&D and improve the technology performance. And this will increase that as well. When you do marketing activity, your market share will go. And when you have bigger market share, more people buying your products, this will affect the word of mouth effect and the people will start to, more people to adopt your products. So you have more diffusion and so on. So this is a quick overview explanation of how the system dynamics at the macro and the micro level is used to model the innovation process. Product side system dynamics modeling with the replacement loop. So when what your products get uh, your market gets saturated, you, you you know you will not have more adopters. And if the people are using the new technology in the replacement of the old technology, there will be a discard rate. And this will also, of course, depend on the technology life time. Be, you know how much it will take before the technology will become out of date or out of fashion. This is, you know, a simple explanation how you, when you use Stella language, for example, you can model, you can see the behavior of the whole system and you'll see the time lag because the effect, the time it takes between different things, it takes time. So this is the word of mouth effect and this is the situation. These are the adopters and these are the potential adopters. And then these are the innovators, the, the people who, you know, the, the, the first group of people who adopt, adopt your products and so on. Finally, in this section, we give you a, a list of references that you can use if you like to dig deeper in uh, any of the topics we covered in this episode. Uh, these are uh, references. Uh, from uh, Wharton School, from Brain Need, from uh, Balance Core Guard Designers, and you have the link to, to them, so you can uh, uh, click on the link and uh, find more about each of those topics. This about measuring innovation. This about the innovation strategy. This is a UK innovation strategy. Build the innovation into your strategy. This is uh, very interesting when you talk about the strategic theme in the balance scorecard, much of the material I presented to you was based on this article. Then the system dynamic, this is a master thesis by Ali Hamidian and system dynamics and technological innovation system. This again, another one, system dynamics. 
And this brings us to the conclusion of this episode. Thank you so much for uh, you know spending this time with us, and I hope uh, that you will find uh, the content of this lecture interesting and join us in other episodes offered by the Global Performance Management Academy. Thank you. Thank you.